Thank you very much. <coughs> well, it's my pleasure to be here. It's usually a big problem uh, talking about TB because tuberculosis is usually not a, a sexy disease or people doesn't want to hear about that. So I'm really, uh, I'm, I feel really lucky and very happy that there is interest from journalists talking about tuberculosis. We are also, what I can say is that our logo, as you can see here, is health solutions for the poor, but probably the people that work in tuberculosis also, we are with the disease of the poor. Nobody want to invest in tuberculosis, nobody want to invest in laboratory tests or even in new drugs or, or even in new ways of doing things. So we are not many. Mm, and this is probably one of the summaries of, of, of this topic because we have a gap in research and investigation for probably 40 years. Okay, let's revise, uh, and I was quite astonished because the proposal of this lecture was talking about challenges in MDR-TV, and I say, what? Well, almost everything's a challenge. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start all the way around. What is not a challenge? So what is not a challenge is, for example, it was discovered by Robert Koch, yeah, probably more or less more than 100 years ago, and also, it's not a challenge that whenever we don't have resistance, we can cure uh, more or less. This is the last area. It's not, it's not going. Okay. Three o'clock advances. Three o'clock. Okay. No, sorry. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to use my own one. Do you have a pointer here? Yeah. Yes. There's a pointer right there. Ah, okay, you? right there. And let's get okay. this back to, to the number one. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So what is not a challenge discovered 100 and something years ago, and also it's not a challenge that whenever we have susceptibility to the drugs developed in the 60s and the 70s, we can cure 95 percent of the cases. What is not a challenge? We know that MDR TB uh, it's caused by exactly the same bacilli discovered by Robert Koch, but the issue is that we cannot. We cannot cure with these drugs from the 60s that they were able to create a prognosis of 95% cure. Do you know what is the prognosis uh, of MDR-TB or, or tuberculosis without any kind of treatment? It's lethal in more than 80% of the case. So we are talking about a quite a lethal, a lethal disease. This is what these drugs, especially rifampicin and INH that they were discovered in the 60s, we could almost cure most of the patients. But nowadays, the picture is changing quite a lot. Why? Because these drugs from the 60s and from the 70s, they are not useful anymore. So if we could cure 95% with them, what do you think is the cure rate when we have resistance to INH and rifampicin? Or let's figure out. We are not definitely doing quite well. Probably the cure rates for these cases is close to 50 percent, yeah? Only one out of two. And do you think all of MDR TB cases are being diagnosed? No, not many of them. We're going to revise it. Okay, so have you ever seen this picture before? Well, this is a little bit busy. I'm gonna be here. Can you all of, all of you understand, hear me well? Yeah. Okay, as you can see here, this is the number of detected and treated MDR TB cases, right? Okay, and this is the percentage of MDR TB cases which are also XDR TB. Do you know what is XDR TB? Yeah, you all know. MDR TB is when you have lose the two pillars of susceptible TB, right? Whenever you are losing the two pillars of the MDR TB treatment, which are the quinones and the injectables, this is an XDR TB. So take a look at that. This graph, this mathematical model, is telling you that the more MDR cases that you diagnose and treat, the more XDR you are creating. So what is tricky about this is, okay, if we are if we are diagnosing a lot, we are creating a lot of SDR. And in fact, SDR is that the result of a bad MDR to be management. So if you do it badly on the susceptible, you are going to create MDR, right? And if you are doing badly on the MDR, you are going to create XDR. So this is the picture now, that the more 
MDR that we are diagnosed, the more XDR that we are creating. What does it mean? It means that we can shift the strains and even increase the pattern of resistance. <coughs> we are not doing very good. We are performing quite poorly on MDR TB management. So my question, do you think that the diagnosed cure rates have changed since the publication of this article? That it was, uh, as you can see, it was seven years ago. Do you think that this has changed? No, not at all, not at all. We are still facing a great risk. Why? Because maybe we are discovering many MDR, but we are not able to cure this MDR. This is why we are amplifying resistance and creating much more XDR to be cases. Do you follow me? Yeah? Okay. No. This is a horribly busy slide. Okay, so I'm going to try to make it a little bit easy. What we have here in green color is the number of cure rates and different parts of the world. But I'm gonna skip all and I'm gonna just focus in Europe. Yeah, okay. Just think about Europe. Okay. What do you see here? What is what is striking for you? That we are only curing less than fifty percent of the MDR TV cases. And I'm not talking about Africa or Middle East. I'm not talking about uh, Asia. No, no, it's Europe. Less than 50% of the cases of MDR are not getting cured. No. Do you know how much is the cure rate for Ebola now? 50%. Well, so what is going on? Something that should be curable is not being getting cured. And also, the pattern of resistance is increasing. The issue is that we are treating very poorly MDR. We are not performing properly. But why are we doing so poorly? It's quite tough for a physician to say that we are not doing enough. And we are doing poorly because it's not easy. It's not easy at all. It's, it's a complicated issue. And why it's not easy? Because there is a complete lack of research to do more than 40 days a day. Just keep in mind what I mentioned in the first slide. We could cure 95% of the cases with the drugs developed in the 60s. Now, do you know how many drugs have been developed in the 60s? Until now. Only one. Only one. So this is telling us that by the time Europeans, Americans, and I come from Spain, uh, we could cope with tuberculosis as a big problem for public health, research is completely stopped. And this is stopped for more than 40 years. This is probably a shame to the scientific community. It shouldn't be like that. So, as you can see, we don't have new TB drugs from the 60s, and we have not any diagnosed tools since the 60s. Now we have the gene expert, and we will go later in that. The issue is that whenever there were solutions for a strong healthcare system in developed countries, everything was stopped. There was not a solution for developing countries where most of the TB cases were and still are. So again, these solutions, especially the Fampicin, INH, Candidopiacinamide, they were good solutions to control in a strong health systems where do you have very good physicians and also very good uh, structure of the, of the health system. But uh, this is not the case for most of the developed countries, developing countries. So, we're going to make like an outline of the challenges. Starting with the challenges, we're going to say challenge number one is comorbidities, especially <coughs> HIV, TB, and also diabetes with TB, and challenges in diagnosis. Then we're gonna go in challenges in treatment and regimens. We definitely new, need new drugs and shorter regimens. Also, we're going to continue with challenges in health systems. Dr. Morgan, yep. are you going to be off my Do you mind using this? No, no, no. Thank Great. you. It, it will be good for my throat also. Thank you very much. So, we're going to face challenge, challenges in health systems, access to care, access to drug, and usually the problem is that tuberculosis is not considered as a social disease. It's definitely a social disease. It's not only an issue of doctors and medicines. Then we're going to see other threats, other situations that may challenge the control of tuberculosis in the world. Okay, so challenges in diagnosis and comorbidities. I'm going to mix these two things because it's not the same diagnosis TB, that TB 
on the HIV patient. Have you received any kind of training or, or lecture about TB HIV or not yet? Yes, I've talked about it a little bit. Yes. Okay, so probably I will skip some of them. The issue is that in general the performance of all microbiology, or microbiology tests, for example the sputum culture, performs exactly or almost the same. But there is a problem. There is a problem with the smear. The smear is the smear sputum is the front line of diagnosis of tuberculosis. But the smear, um, the reliability or, 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 or the yield of the smear on the HIV patient is much reduced. Did they tell you that most of the patients uh, HIV positive, they are also smear negative? You heard about that. But also, what do people have on the guidelines? On the guidelines, what you have there is that you should take the smear positive because they are the ones that are transmitting more the disease. At the end, at the same time, the smear are negative, for example, these HIV patients, they are going to die very quickly and you cannot diagnose with the main tool that we have to diagnose, that is sputum smear. Okay. So sputum smear, or smear negative, in the people living with HIV it's it's an unmeasured short of deaths and lost opportunities for treatment. Let me explain a little bit about that. Again, the issue, as you all of you may know, HIV AIDS is a virus that is parasiting a specific cell of the human body, that is the CD4 and the macrophage. CD4 and the macrophage are the main barriers against one disease, that is tuberculosis. Right? So HIV AIDS is destroying the main barrier against tuberculosis. And take a look at this. The lower the CD4 count, the more atypical presentation of tuberculosis. The more atypical, and the more deadly. Take a look at this. For example, whenever you have more than 500 CD4, you're going to have a, a typical tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, smia positive, chest x-ray positive. But whenever the CD4 are going down, you are starting to have, for example, pleural effusion, lymphogranulomas, or tuberculosis meningitis, or even, for example, hepatitis tuberculosis, or tuberculosis in your bone marrow. So maybe you can break with a tuberculosis that it's only fever and anemia. What do you think is much more difficult to diagnose? This kind of tuberculosis with fever or anemia, or something typical with a cavity in the chest x-ray, and also an sputum positive? It's much more difficult to diagnose. And it's also much more difficult to diagnose because we don't have very good tools. The only tools, by the way, sputum smear, was discovered by Cox, Robert Cox himself, 100 years ago, and the chest x-ray more than 100 years ago as well. So we are working with very old-fashioned uh, old tools. So again, another busy slide, but this is AFP smear, the percentage. And what we have here on the axis is the level of CD4. Yeah? So what is telling us that the less CD4, the more smear negative. And again, the same. But this with chest x-ray, the less CD4, from 0 CD4 to 500 CD4, the less CD4, the less cavitation that we found on the chest x-ray. So if you have a cavity, but you have a smear positive, it's easy. But if you don't have cavities, and you don't have smears, it's very complicated, exactly the same. The less CD4, the more normal that is the chest X-ray. So which one do you think are the tools in developing countries to diagnose tuberculosis? Chest X-ray and smears. So my point is that whenever we have a bad immunocompromised patient, chest X-ray is negative, a smear is negative, but if you have access to culture, you are going to diagnose it. But uh, do you think developing countries have access, easy access to culture? No. And do you know how much time is taking? More than two months. And do you know how many years ago, uh, how many years have TB culture as a technique? More than 60. Again, completely outdated tools. Why? Because probably 
when it was a problem in Europe countries. It, it was less than a problem in European countries and in the US or developed countries. Everything stopped. There was no research. It's definitely a shame on the scientific community. And again, from my studies from South Africa, what was happening here is that in the studies, post-mortem studies, what did they discover? If people living with us with HIV AIDS completely asymptomatic, they were dying because of a known cause of death, 50% of them in the post-mortem studies, what do they have? Active tuberculosis. It was smear negative, chest x-ray negative. This is the reality not only in South Africa, this is the reality in most part of the world and high burden countries. And what's happening with TB and diabetes? Exactly the same. As you may know, diabetes is reducing the immune status of the person with, uh, with having sugar problems. And in fact, the issue is that the higher that you have your hemoglobin 1AC levels, have you, any one of you, have a relative with, with diabetes? I have a relative, yeah, almost everyone. Okay, this is the measure to check how are you in your glycemia, not for once, but for a couple of months ago. The higher the levels of hemoglobin, the more, uh, the, the worse that you are controlling your diabetes. And the worse that you are controlling your diabetes, the more likely, the more prone you are to get a tuberculosis, to suffer a tuberculosis, and do you think it's going to be a chest X-ray positive and a smear positive? No. It's going to be an atypical one yeah, because there is no inflammation. Okay. Let me tell you, and someone from Indonesia here. No, no one, no one from Indonesia. Let me tell you something about. I, I was asking because in Indonesia and in most uh, incoming countries, countries that are starting to to experiment a, a great uh, economical develop, they are increasing the levels of diabetes quite quite a lot. What I discover. On, on, on the world is that 30% of the MDR TB cases, they were diabetic. Zero HIV, but they were diabetic. And you know what? 40% of the healthcare workers taking care of this MDR, they were also diabetic. So they were exposed to getting an MDR TB. So this is quite an issue to put attention as well. And let me tell you about a story of a young physician working in, in Central Africa in 2005. This is, this is something that happened to me in four, five, five years, well, almost 10 years ago. I was working in a hospital with no running water, no electricity, many, many HIV patients, many, many TB patients. And let me tell you, this was the, the kind of patient that I was receiving, extraordinarily poor from rural Africa, from the middle of nowhere. And, and also these patients, they were coming to the clinic with completely atypical symptoms and signs. For example, they, they were only having fever or sort of breathe. And at the same time, they were chest X-ray negative, SMEA negative, and of course, if I didn't have water all the time, and I didn't have electricity all the time, do you think that I have access to culture? No, 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 no access to culture. So they were asking me, doctor, do I have tuberculosis? And I said, okay, sorry, because I think that you have tuberculosis, but all the tests are negative for tuberculosis. So I cannot assume that you have TB, even if I think that you have TB. The guidelines were quite a stretch, and they were promoting the management of those who were smear positive. So all results are negative. You don't have TB. Come in a couple of weeks and let's see if the smear is positive. But the patient was not coming. Why do you think the patient was not coming? Yeah, because they were dying. They were dying in front of my face. And it is extraordinarily frustrating for anyone who is working in developed countries or who, for anyone who is working with patients. Really, really frustrating. This was something promoted because of the guidelines. And I was working with the local guidelines and also with the international guidelines. So the patient was never returning. And again, take a look at this. There's post-mortem post studies from people living with HIV AIDS. 
they were dying in front of me because of asymptomatic active pulmonary TB. So it, it was needed more than six years for the international guidelines to move forward and establish that we don't have to be so academic. And, and probably the, the move is going from the diagnosis of TB in the HIV to the likelihood of the TB on the HIV patient. We need to be much more sensible and include much more patients using the symptoms and also it uses sputums and all that. So the point is that, just keep in mind that main diagnosis tools are old fashioned and they have a very reduced sensitivity. They are not catching all of the patients. They are missing many. Just consider the sputum smear is missing 30% of the patients with a normal immune status, but it's probably missing or losing more than 50% of those with problems with immunity. Okay, HIV AIDS is quite restrictive to some countries, but we have a looming epidemic of diabetes, and TB diabetes is going to be quite important. And what about MDR? About MDR, the classical phenotypic culture, as I mentioned, it was invented by Canetti more than, uh, it, it was in the 50s, so more than 60 years ago. They, they have lots of drawbacks. They, they need, a special one, they need viability of the sample specimen. For example, if I get a sputum sample and I put it here, right close uh, of, of, of the sun, they're going to kill, the sun is going to kill the bacilli. So maybe I go and put it into the culture. The culture will not grow. Yeah? So you need the viability. And for having viability of the samples, you need careers and you need a good bureaucratic way or you need a logistical issues that some of these countries don't have this kind of logistic circuits. And again, the more important limitation from the clinical perspective is that the culture can take one or two months. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is quite a different bacilli. It's, it's, it's a very peculiar, uh, very peculiar bacteria. This bacteria is a very slow grower, need two months for growth. So, for example, imagine that you are going to the doctor and you ask for, for an opinion, yeah? And they say, what can I do, okay, which kind of treatment? And, and they say, okay, I'm going to make a test, and in two months, I will tell you. You like that. No, you want a solution now, right away. So waiting two months is completely unacceptable from, from a clinical perspective. And again, technically, it's difficult. You need a quality laboratory, and also uh, you need the staff well trained and also you need equipment. As we mentioned in most of high burden countries, the qualification of the staff is not quite well and also the quality of the lab is quite reduced. And again it's not only that it takes one or two months to grow, it's also the delays in the result report. At the end of the day, in countries like Peru, what we find is that there is like four to six months delay in getting the results. So it's not that you are not going to have your response right now. It's not that you are going to have your response in two months, maybe six months later. So diagnose MDRTB, maybe it's going to take you six months. Definitely a very old tool. We need to go farther. Nobody investigates about this. So, and you are thinking that maybe the drug susceptibility test is perfect, but it's not perfect. Even Canetti, the person who, who developed this technique, he mentioned already that it's, it's a very good technique for drugs who have a very, very good high action, a very good power to kill bacilli. Especially, it's very good for isoniazid, rifampicin, so good because we can diagnose MDR, and probably it's quite good as well to fluoroquinolone and injectables. So the issue is that outdated, coming late, need staff, need laboratory, not reliable 100%. So probably we are working with very, very outdated tools. And again, we have mm, probably the best and uh, most revolutionary moment that is the, the upcoming of, of GeneXpert. Do you know where GeneXpert is coming from? GeneXpert is coming from, from the US when they were starting to make their first alarms uh, because of anthrax, biohazards, yeah, and this kind of bioterrorism. So it was developed a small PCR amplification and detection, a small pieces of DNA. 
So they start to build it up for anthrax, and they develop, they develop it for other diseases. In that case, it was very, very good for tuberculosis. So it's taking a piece of DNA and amplify this piece of DNA. So they say, okay, this is mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it's also amplifying the specific part of the DNA that when it's mutated, confer resistant to rifampicin. That is the most important TB drug to reduce the treatment. Whenever we are losing rifampicin, we need to go to 18 months of treatment, 24 months of treatment. So, GeneXpert have completely changed our way of working with tuberculosis. <coughs> but this advance, uh, this is some kind of technology that it was very quickly developed for HIV on the 80s. So why on earth we have to wait for 2010 for having this kind of technology? Again, people who work in tuberculosis, we have a disease, but, but our disease is poverty. Right? We, we don't have a lot of here. So it's quite a very good tool with similar sensibility to liquid media, also very good for a sputum. Uh, even when the sputum is, is smear negative, it can detect many of the bacilli that the microscopes do not detect. So the issue is that it increases the sensibility. So you are able to diagnose much more patients. And what do you think about this? Do you, have, do you think they, they have a, any kind of limitation? Can you figure out any kind of limitation? Yeah, it's very expensive. Are you coming from India? Yeah. yeah. So the, this one is that they, they, they started, but there's one study in India that they mentioned if the Indian National Tuberculosis Program use as many gene experts as the guidelines say, it will eat all of the budget <laughs> from the NTP. Yeah. So they said, okay, it's a great, great idea, wonderful, but it's still too expensive. This is a disease of the poor. If something is expensive, it's it's going to be much less accessible. You need accessible. And also, apart from the price, the key issue is that it's not really a point of care test. You need electricity. You need a stable, a stable electricity. You also need temperature below 25 degrees. So you can make it, but, but, but it, it's, still, it's still not the perfect thing. When we are extraordinarily needing is something like, for example, with HIV, something to do in the blood. Then, 20 minutes later, you get it there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, the machine is very tricky. The machine is, but it's a little bit tricky. It's not that the machine is expensive. Cartridge is also. Cartridge. It, it, it's like printers. Yeah. Okay. You can easily buy a printer, uh, but then cartridges are expensive. Okay. So the issue is that you need to fit the machine with cartridges. They are reducing the price. Now the cartridges are $10, but the price of the sputum smear is less than $0.2. So it's like 20 times expensive, much more expensive. So for who's benefit? Who is benefit? TB is for the disease that is poor. Yeah. But picture you think that uh, about money, which is made for the patient. It's diagnosis, you won't smear negative. Yeah, but you, if people cannot afford it, are you going to succeed in what, what you are achieving? No. Yeah. Well, the, the, the point is that this is probably the best mm, ever invented for diagnosis of tuberculosis oh. since the SMEA. Oh, okay. We should uh, strongly go for these kind of things. It's not the only one. I, I, there are still barriers to access this. You cannot put one in every health post. But this is what I would like to have, one yeah. in every health post. This is not real because it's expensive. Even say that the Chinese are I giving. Make them down. Make them down. Make them down. And and also and also as I mentioned, there's now started a competition. The Chinese people have developed a very similar machine. With, yeah, and the price is much more close. So for the first time, um, there is like something new on the diagnosis of TB, yeah. that this is the main lack, that, that people is not investing in something that is killing two million people per year. Okay, so let me continue. Again, the TBHIV, they are more difficult to diagnose, worse prognosis, and more difficult to cure. But it's not the only thing. They are also much more prone to deadly outbreaks. 
So infection control is another challenge, especially whenever we have TB HIV people and also TB and diabetes people. Yeah? So we should be moving towards prevention. Prevention is, again, one of the biggest challenges. Um, as you can see here, these are different hospitals from developed countries in the 80s and 90s where they were experimenting mdr -TB outbreaks with this kind of lethality rate, 89%, 95%, 98%. And do you know what happened 10 years later, 20 years later? Exactly the same issue, but in Africa. And it was not with MDRTV, it was XDRTV. Lethality rate, 98% in less than two weeks after diagnosis. Why? Because people with HIV and also XDRTV, they were like in this, uh, have you seen this before? In any, in any hospital? Hospitals are absolutely overcrowded. Someone from South Africa or from rural Africa. Yeah. I would, uh, every day. Each and every day. It's, it's the normal issue. Absolutely. But it's not in your country. If, if you go to Nicaragua. You can wait for a week. Yeah. Mm. And this is the reality. Well, at least it's a line. But this is to hell a ferry that they are all back in the same place. Yeah, because the, the line is outside. It's fine. It's outside. But they are back in a small waiting area. If one has XDR and the other have HIV, what is going to happen? Primary transmission to others. In fact, in this deadly outbreak, what happened is that one XDR case got to the others. They were all the same strain. And this was in 2006. 2006 was the starting point for the first time on new drugs and also new research for tuberculosis. Why this outbreak with XDR created so much alarm? Probably there's a uh, tricky issue there. For the first time, it was demonstrated that HIV people, people living with HIV AIDS, that they could be probably living quite a normal life and just feeling like a chronic disease, were capable or able to die, to die because of a curable disease like tuberculosis. So and this is probably my interpretation saying, OK, the pharma industry was saying, OK, what is going to happen? We might be losing our revenues from the ARVs because people is going to die because of tuberculosis. And also TB in one place is TB everywhere. The borders are more porous than ever. Yeah? For example, I'm now here, but next week I will be working in Morocco. And two weeks later, I've been working in Turkey. If I get an XDR, I will be spreading XDR everywhere. So for the first time, it was a menace for developed countries. So it's been a call to arms for the first time in 40 years to start developing new drugs and new diagnosis solutions. Again, the same issue is really a shame on scientific community neglect tuberculosis. Probably tuberculosis could be the perfect example of the neglected, TB, of the neglected disease. So as you can see here, uh, imagine, for example, that this is HIV or this is diabetes and this is the speed that we go in tuberculosis. Can you imagine that, for example, you are treating diabetes with the same drugs developed in the 60s? It's not in your head. Or you are treating hypertension with the same tool or with the same drug than in the 60s? There's no point in this. This is really a shame. OK, so again, let's go with challenges in treatment and regimens. As you can see here, especially for MDR-TB, whenever we are losing rifampicin and INH susceptibility, we need to go to a very, very long treatment, two years treatment. And these drugs and regimens, they work well, but they are far, far than optimal. Why? Because it takes two years. They have plenty of toxicity, and the other is have to be and dose by dose. It's very difficult to be poor. It's also very difficult to be with the disease two years. It's also very difficult to hold this disease for two years and also the toxicity of the side effects. Okay. 
again, it's not easy. These regimens are working wonderfully in randomized control trials. By the way, we don't have many. But it's working quite well on the paper. But then, do you know what, what patients do? They default. I admire quite a lot to my patients because they are with painful shots each and every day. Probably, I, I, I would figure out, you have, you, have a, um, you have to be a very, very strong person with a great will to get healed to bear this kind of two years regimen. Not, not easy to understand. And again, you need a very strong health systems. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a communicable disease, but you need, you need something similar like for chronic disease. You need some, someone that is coming daily to the health facility. You know, most of these health facilities are not prepared to have this kind of chronic patient. And also, as I mentioned, it's not something unusual that you go and see the patient with TB for one year taking medications and coughing, but on the other side, you have the children waiting to have an immunization, yeah? the children with asthma. That's a reality. So many challenges going on there. You need strong health systems. Again, this is the current standard. Do you think it's easy, this kind of treatment? No? This is one shot. This is canamycin, lubofloxacin, methionamide, cyclosherine, piracinamide for six months, and then 18 months with lubofloxacin, methionamide, cyclosherine, and piracinamide. But watch out, because this is only uh, one word, lubofloxacin. But usually, it's uh, split it into three pills. Yeah? So these are three pills, three pills, three pills, maybe four, five pills, one shot, and also the patient have gastric intolerance, on top of that, omeprazole, vitamin D6, probably another three pills, if the patient has any other disease. At the end of the day, what the patient has is a bunch of pills on the hand. Do you think it's easy? Each and every day is not easy. It's not user-friendly, not at all. I perfectly understand why even in Europe, the cure rate is 50%. Okay. Even say that, in the spontaneous curation of tuberculosis, it was 25, 30%, so we are adding not too much. So again, what do you think about the treatment of 30, 24 months? Very uncomfortable. And what do you think about toxicity? More than. And again, think about that. Henry loves. Do you like music? <laughs> I love music. <laughs> so you can say, okay, it's better being deaf than being dead. But being deaf is quite painful. You know, I, I want to hear my my son telling me stories something that is limiting your life quite a lot. So it's not, not easy to be added to this kind of very toxic regimen. And, and again, what do you think of it? Also, being poor, do you like to be poor? No, I, I don't want to have necessities. But also, would you like to go each and every day to the health center? No, because it interacts too much with your normal life. It's very, very difficult, it's not easy. So, and again, Often the patients, as they are diagnosed very late, they are entering into treatment very, very late. The prognosis of someone that is coming early, this is like cancer at the end of the day. This is like chemotherapy, toxic, long-lasting. If you are diagnosed early, you are going to have much better prognosis than if you are diagnosed late. With current tools, most of these cases are diagnosing late. So sometimes a patient comes to me with a massive hole in their lungs, and I can cure tuberculosis, but they are going to be stuck to, um, to an oxygen, um, how do you call it, oxygen bottle for the rest of their lives. Or maybe they die because they have a bleeding, because they have too many scars. So it's, it's not, a, not an easy question. And again, <coughs> not everything is bad. We have good news, we have now this kind of regimen. Have you ever heard about that? It's the Bangladesh regimen. Mm -hmm. no? It's a combination of drugs that it's not two years, it's nine months. So it's nine months, so it's reducing quite a lot the length of the regimen. It's much more easy to have adherence to a nine months regimen rather than a two years or even more regimen. But again, probably it's not enough because as you can see here, the Bangladesh regimen is four months with canamycin, injectable, high doses that 
ethionamide for theonamide, or sulfofacimin, amitol, cinamide, high doses, INH, again, another bunch of pills. And please keep in mind that the patient is not taking clofacimine or prosuramide, the patient is taking pills. So the more pills that they are getting, the more difficult that they are getting. This is not a user friendly. It's much better probably than the other. Yeah? But, but it's not a user friendly. Even say that, we really need to move into something similar like this, like the Bangladesh regimen. But so far, it's not uh, promoted by WHO because there is not enough evidence. We need a stronger evidence to promote this regimen widely. Probably we need to stop uh, and, and get information for one or two years. Yeah? So WHO is not um, recommending the Bangladesh regimen? No, because the issue is that it is not, it's a tricky question. Yeah? It's, it's not something that is completely black or white, no. The issue is that gadifloxacin, for example, is, is not initially not allowed uh, it's not uh, the use of catifloxacin for tuberculosis is off label, yeah? and the use of clofacimin for tuberculosis is off label. Yeah? For example, clofacimin they are using only for lepra, right? Lepra, lepra, leprosin. Yeah? Leprosin. So it's it's not an issue. It, it, I understand perfectly why WHO cannot. It's not that they don't want that they cannot because this is off-label. And to use something off-label, you need to be quite, quite sure, right? And by now, we don't have enough evidences. We don't have more than 2,000 patients under this treatment. But I think that in the near future, when more information about the safety of this regimen is done, we will shift into something much more easy like this. Okay? One and two. How long has this regimen been used? How? Sorry? How long has this regimen been used? It's been used for more than two years. The issue is that it, it's been used primarily in Bangladesh. And now there are experimental places with the support of WHO in Benin, in Burkina Faso, in Cameroon, and in some other Francophone countries in, in, in Central Africa. Okay. Probably you will be talking more about, about this Bangladesh regimen. But it's, it's, it's certainly an opportunity. Yeah. And also the issue, uh, as we mentioned, this is a disease of the poor. The 24 months regimen is really expensive. This one nine month regimen using gatifloxacin is $200. So the cheapest, the more accessible again. Okay. So probably this is the kind of health solutions that we are needing. Yeah. I, 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 again, it's, it's taking too much time. It's, it's arriving to us 40 years with a 40 years delay. <laughs> okay, more, more questions or comments? No, I think no. you answered my question. Okay, fine. So again, nine months less toxic. We are improving, but it's still many pills and definitely the issue is that we need new drugs. You know, we, for example, with HIV AIDS, they, they were in less than 30 years, there are more than 50 different antiretrovirals. How many years of epidemic do we have for tuberculosis? Probably three million years epidemic of tuberculosis, as long as we are human beings. Yeah? Not even homo sapiens, human beings. Yeah? We've been with this disease, and we have less than 15 drugs. Yeah? With HIV, we have more than 50 in less than, than three decades of massive epidemic. So th there's an issue going on here. Again, new drugs for the first time. We have pedaquilin already in use for compassionate use, and we have telamanine. Yeah. But what is the point? Uh, what is the, the key issue here? That for making a salvage regimen, we need at least three new drugs. It's like HIV. We, with two drugs, we don't have enough. And one of the points is, is that probably are not going to be wide available for high burden and poor countries. So the issue is, again, accessibility. For example, if I want to buy Vedaculin in Barcelona, it's going to take me probably, I think it's like um, 2,000 euros per month. Yeah. There are reduced prices for other countries, for high burden countries, and also for, for low income countries, but not as accessible as it should be. And also the Lamani, 
we know it's there, but we don't have still access to it, not even for compassionate youth. So this is going too uh, slowly. And, and as, as I mentioned, it's not enough to construct new, new salvage regimes. My fear is that they are going to be uh, slowly uh, coming up new drugs for the management of TV. But for example, if, if we have the Adatuli now, and then in five, ten years we have the Lamanid, and then in five, ten years we have another drug, maybe we are going to create resistance faster to this one. Because we are introducing only a new one. So the very good thing would be like in the HIV field, that in 2006 they have like five, four new drugs, so you can cure most of the cases with these new regimens. So we need more drugs, we, and especially we need more sterilizing drugs. We need new rifampicins. What I mean is that rifampicin is the only drug so far that it's able to shorten the regimen from 24 months into something like six months. So why is rifampicin so effective? Because there are two different kind of population of bacilli. There are bacilli which are actively dividing, and some bacilli that are, are like metabolically not active. They are sleeping. Yeah. These bacilli which are sleeping, they are not dividing. Yeah. And they are not creating disease, but they are creating relapses. So you need drugs that kill those who are metabolically active and those who are dormant. There's a big problem with the stockouts of MDRTB drugs. The market don't see, uh, or the pharma industry, I don't know how to call it, but they have a, a wide market for it. Do you know countries that have experiment stockouts getting shortage of medications, of MDRTB medications? I can give you an example. The United States, 
experiment at Stockhouse of MD antibiotics a couple of years ago, different friends. By the time of the, do you remember, the, the Fukushima incident? Yeah. Well, very close to Fukushima is the, the main manufacturer of cannabis in the world. When they have all these, um, this kind of earthquake with all these problems and the cleaning and the nuclear, uh, nuclear station, there was a complete stock out for the whole world of cannabising, you know. So there is a gap of market there, but the pharma industry doesn't see it. Please keep in mind that more than 200,000 people is dying because of MDR. So there are at least half a million cases per year. We need drugs. It's difficult access to MDR TV drugs. So again, whenever clinicians don't have drugs, they are forced to do improvisation, improvisations. Yeah? And also improvisations usually extrapolating to increasing of resistance. They say, okay, if I don't have a twin alone, I will try with cyclosine. You know, the roles of the drugs, as they are very poor, they, they each drug have, have a specific role. And I'm not going to go in depth into this. It's, it's not easy. We need drugs. The improvisation is, is not an issue. And, and as I mentioned, I supervise probably more than 20 different countries. All of these 20, 25 countries, all of them have a stock out of MDR TB medication. The Lufat Medicines and Frontiers, MSF, is one of the NGOs that is strongly pushing to increase access of these medicines. We need, if there are no drugs, forget about that, there's no treatment. There's no treatment, no treatment. Um, or even if, if no treatment, wonderful. But as I mentioned, it's worse having a bad treatment than a no treatment at all. We will be increasing XDR. So, and also MDRTV is not only an issue of drugs and doctors, not at all. There are many other things that, you know, I, I was mentioned by a politician of a country that I'm not going to mention that said to me, okay, I want a running MDR TV site in less than two months. Forget it. Don't, don't come with me. You know, because to have a successful MDR TV site, you need a network of people doing things. And also, these doctors have to be trained. You need a network of people able to collect this drug. Drug procurement is strongly difficult and takes time. You know these drugs, MDR TV drugs, they are made upon request. So it's, it's not that we have an stock and we are asking. No, no. We are asking, they produce, and then go to these countries. Absolutely a shame. This is really a shame condition. It shouldn't be like that. But we have another difficulty. Another difficulty is that our population, our patients, are usually the poor among the poorest. Right? Again, very reduced access to care, low education, very low income capacity, addiction, and social exclusion. Sometimes the problem of these people, but you don't have to go there. I, I used to be the medical director of the reference TV center in Barcelona, and what you find there is that the less important thing for the patient was the disease. They were, for example, taking junk from different parts, and they say, okay, if I come into the health facility, I will not take junk. If I don't take junk, I cannot buy the junk, and I cannot get money. If I don't have money, my son is not going to eat. So what do you think is what giving priority? It was giving priority to his job. Yeah? And also, it's very important that this patient, even they feel cured after the third or the fourth month because they don't have symptoms, they have to continue because if not, they will relapse. Yeah? This is, again, one of the issues that why most of these patients, or many of these patients, and none on the other. Yeah. It's very, very difficult. So it cannot be only an issue of doctors and medicines. You strongly need social support. And this social support usually is neglected by countries or even because of organization. Yeah. So again, if you are doomed to fail, if you are not considered social determinants, and especially a big focus on, on big cities, and you need to do something with support uh, and adherence. Adherence is the key factor for success. This is why adherence to 24 months is much more difficult to nine months. So the issue is we need to make it shorter, much more effective. 
And by the time new drugs appear, we need to strongly work in adherence and social issues. So again, it's not easy being poor. It's not easy holding a disease with unpleasant drugs for two years. This is among the roots of why we are doing so poorly in MDR activity. And again, I'm going to tell you, as you are uh, media people, I'm going to tell you about the, the, the strangest side effect I see in my life as a physician. Okay, I was in, in one country from, from the Caribbean, and, and I tell the patient, why are you not taking the medication? He was susceptible at that time, yeah? The patient was getting, having tuberculosis, already diagnosed. He was working in the construction, and he was starting taking the pills, and then stop. Taking the pills, and then stop. Taking the pills, stop. And I say, but I already told you that this is a high risk behavior, because you can get resistant, and then it's much more difficult. And they say to me, well, um, this is, it's very painful to get with this medication, and they were susceptible medication. Uh, it, they were found, blah, blah, blah. And, and they say they say to me, it's very difficult for me to take this medication because I have a horrible side effect. I'm really, really hungry, and I don't have money to buy the necessary food that these pills are giving me. Do you think that the pills were giving the side effect was that the patient was hungry? No, he was getting here. And he was starting to eat, but he was needing. So he decided to stop because he could not afford taking as many food as he was needing. And at the end of the day, this kind of poverty drive him to NDR. This is a really, really painful situation. This happened six years ago. I am very sure that it's already happened in many other countries. So behind any MDR debate patient, there's a very sad story. Okay, so the people that we are working with MDR, we are facing, we are like these Chinese acrobats, no? with trying to make equilibrium between resistant, toxicity, pill burden, lengthy treatment, TB HIV, poverty, unemployment, addiction, late diagnosis, or not even access to, to care. So challenges, there are many, many. But on the roots of these challenges is that mm, there's a horrible shame on the scientific community not investing in TB for the four for the past 40 years. No new diagnosis tools, no drugs, no vaccines. So I already mentioned about comorbidities, challenges in, in diagnosis, challenges in treatment, challenges in health systems. I'm going to end this presentation with other challenges. And again, one of the biggest one is the lack of funding. Uh, no one really cares about this massive disease. You know, um, People is putting attention to any, and many other things. I know there's no funding to fund everything, but we should be going to eliminate this disease. We can prevent TB, we can cure TB. Why don't we eliminate TB? So again, the issue is that there's no funding for technical assistance, for diagnosis, for tools, for medicines, for health system. Again, the issue is that the risk of shifting from susceptible to MDR and um, shifting from MDR to XDR should be a call to arms to developing and also especially developed countries research. Again, we have a problem with fine diversion. And even, for example, investing too much in MDR could be a risk. Why investing too much in MDR? Because if you are putting all your money on MDR, probably you are going to neglect susceptible TB. You need to be a step forward. You need to cure all your TB patients. And then, if you are curing all your TB cases, you are not going to create MDR TB. Yeah? But nowadays, we have plenty of MDR. We have to give a response to these patients as well. And at the same time, most of the new cases, MDR TB new cases, they are coming from primary transmission. So there is primary transmission. What I mean is, for example, if I'm MDR and I'm coughing into someone of you, you are going to have MDR. Yeah. So most of the MDR TB cases are coming from primary transmission. There is transmission in the community. So the issue is that we have to do both. Go for MDR TB management, but also do not forget, you have to cure as much 
TB cases as possible for susceptible ones. And again, funding and attention going to other diseases or projects. This is quite an issue. I'm going to put a wonderful picture here to finish. Do you know what is this? This is a moon eclipse. Eclipse. How, how do you say it in English? Eclipse. It's a beautiful picture from the space with an eclipse. But there is something that is eclipsing my patients. Do you know what is this something that is eclipsing my patients? It's this guy. It's Ebola. Yeah? And I'm the referent of Ebola for the whole conference as well. And I have to say that I finished my presentation yesterday afternoon because Ebola took me all my time. So what I say is that probably with this Ebola outbreak, many funding that was going to MDR or was going or attention that it was going to MDR is going now to Ebola. Please don't lose the focus. Ebola is killing probably now 5,000 people in Africa and it's really painful. But nowadays, at this point of year, for sure, more than 3,000, 300,000 Africans are dying because of TB. So please, don't, don't lose perspective. Of course, this is a risk. We have to do something like that. But if, imagine, for example, that my government hired me for Ebola. Tuberculosis would lose me. Yeah? And this is a challenge. That every five, 10 years, we have a different outbreak, and it's still tuberculosis is a disease of the poor, or we are with a disease of poverty and tuberculosis. Yeah? So please keep these figures in mind. No? Yeah. And, uh, also, MDR and XDR is completely out of control. Yeah. So finally, and this is the last message, uh, we have a lack of lobby. Most of the success uh, finding HIV were because uh, the patients were strongly pushing, the media was strongly pushing for a solution on tuberculosis, sorry, on, on HIV. So what I really want is to you to do your part. You have a role to play in this. Please do your part, talk to people about what you have learned here, that this is a reality, this is a hidden reality, not everyone sees it, it doesn't mean that it not exists. You have a role here, I, I would really, um, I, I, I would feel really, really happy if someone of you talk about this, about this shame in the scientific community, about the, the strong needs that we have. So you have a, a role. You have you are one of the challenges. There, there is not enough tuberculosis in the media. Uh, Ebola is coping all. Yeah? So please, I really strongly um, ask you to, to do your part and um, as much as possible, we need a lobby among journalists and patients. Okay, well, I think this is all this drive me to the end of my presentation, if you want to make any question or comment. And also I want to apologize because there was lots of scientific issues, especially at the very beginning, and something sometimes a little, a little bit tough. But if you have any question or comment, I would be pleased to. Yeah? Are there some information about the efficiency of uh, new drugs? which are experiment if they are tested in some uh, countries. Yeah. Yes, there are most of these new drugs, pedatulin and the lamarin. You can find information about them on the page from from W sorry, from WHO. You know there are there are new guidelines for, for the lamarin and also for then they opened these these guidelines yesterday. They they make like the official kickoff of these guidelines yesterday. And for the Lamani, there is one with more than one year. These new drugs, uh, they are in, in, in clinical trials. They are in phase two, phase two, phase three, in different parts. But probably they are going to be, um, Vedaculin is a reality now. People is treating patients with Vedaculin now. And probably the Lamani is going to be a reality next or in the next two years. Let's see. But you can get more information in the web page. Also, our, our next from TB Alliance is going to address the both of these drugs as well. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I, I'm just wondering uh, whose shame is that? Who, whose shame? You mentioned it's a shame we, 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 we don't no. have any, any new, uh, yeah. new drugs and new, new diagnosis. Yeah. And uh, is the shame of the uh, self defense community or the shame of the government? It's, it's very difficult to put a finger on someone specific. Yeah? It's 
difficult to blame someone, but the issue is that despite this disease has been killing for thousands of years human beings, and it's continued killing whenever it, it was not anymore a risk for developed countries, everything just stop. So probably it's a shame, pharma <coughs> industry, it's a shame, developing developed countries, governments, it's a shame from the scientific community. You know, for example, HIV AIDS, it was affecting quite hard developed countries. So people was, was investing quite a lot. Nowadays, people is investing for the first time in many years in tuberculosis because XDR and MDR is could be risking countries, European or Western countries. So it's difficult to blame on someone, but for sure there are responsibilities. But there's a gap of more than 40 years without a strong investment in drugs or foreign tools. Do you have an idea how much budget for TB and MDR have been, do you have an idea how much budget for TB and MDRTB have been in the channel in Ebola and uh, what's the source of this funding? Well, I, I don't have a clear number on the corporate comparison between what is starting to be flowing to Ebola and what is the gap for TB. I'm, I'm not sure. But I know that, that the gap of funding for TB, especially considering TB elimination, it's of billions of dollars. You know, they, they are investing less than the half that they should be investing. I'm saying we are making the case, WHO, well, countries, overall. It's a big, big gap over that. I, I cannot give you a precise figure. Yesterday in the Stop TV partners, there were, there were people putting these kind of figures, but I can't remember perfectly. So I prefer not to tell you a precise figure because I am going to mistake. But uh, we should be at least on the TV side, getting double the funding if we want to eliminate tuberculosis, or at least if we want to avoid the increase of MDR and XDR. It's definitely not enough. Okay, more, more questions or comments? So what's, what's the global funding for TB and the MRT if you have the TV? Sorry? What's the global funding for TB and NDRP? Um, is there such a thing? I, I cannot find someone that can tell you, but, but I, I don't have in my mind in right now which one is the figure. But I can find people and that, that can tell you. Yeah. For sure, I, I guess someone is going to talk about is there coming someone from Global Fund or from the Start TV partnership for the next days? We, we had the Stop TV partnership. Um, and they might that. be able to, um, our speaker on the first day might be able to help you with that question. Yeah, for sure. Dennis Falston or Ernesto Camillo, someone like that, can tell you precise figures. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Very it was good. a pleasure. Thank yeah. you very much.